There she comes. There, sorry, I guess I was on a different link. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. That's why I said resend the panelists uh, email. How are you? Good. I'm hiding in my son's basement because he's got a Zoom going on up there. We got the dogs and the cleaning person. <laughs> so I'm hiding from everyone. <laughs> I understand. I actually got out of my house. I, I built a little office down the street from me on the waterfront. And oh, so, God. yeah, there's a waterfront down here. I'll tell you all about it in a different call. Um, cool. It actually it actually fits in with this conversation, um, Dana Cadena and I. But, yeah, I just escaped from my husband because he had off today. So I said, I'm going down to the office. Uh, yeah, I'm in Ohio, or I would have done the same. <laughs> so, Linda, um, I'll just introduce. We've had we have a bunch of people on right now. There's about 22 participants. They keep coming on. We also are Facebook Live on my personal page, and um, I just love spending time with you. This is Linda McKissick. Uh, Linda will introduce herself a bit and, and share a bit of her journey. Yet, I just want to start by saying. When I got into the business in 2004, I was brought into Keller Williams um, to the first office with Adele DeMauro. And Adele DeMauro is one of our very amazing OPs, one of our most successful women OPs in, in, in the company. And um, Linda introduced Adele. And so without Linda and Jimmy introducing Adele and Rich DeMauro to Keller Williams, to bring Keller Williams to an area inside New Jersey where we really had no Kel. It was Keller Who Land. Mm -hmm. Was I, and as a new agent, I didn't know any difference. So I was just looking for a specific type of company, something that trained me, and somebody who gave me a good split. And so, because Adele had done such a great job at, at at marketing herself inside of our neighborhood growing up, she was the obvious choice for my mom when it said, "Well, who should we talk to about a real estate career?" And so there were other people, Gina Coppola as well, my sponsor, who was also affiliated with Adele. Um, but one thing I can say is through the coaching and mentorship of Linda to Adele to Gina to myself, we really formed a um, family, whether we were in New Jersey, Texas, wherever, of how are we going to have a big business or a big life? Forget about the business. We want the big life. And what are all the pieces that, that go to it? So... From the get-go, Linda has inspired me um, in sharing rather than recruiting. We're sharing opportunities. And I love where she's gone with it. And I've, I've watched her journey, and I, I want to hear more about where she is today. But um, Linda, thank you for being that mentor in my life. Although we don't get to talk so much, I know you watch me, and I watch you. And, and I, I feel a little teary-eyed right now, but I just thank you. So you're muted. Mute you. Yeah, and I thank you because uh, my life has been changed dramatically by bringing on Adele, who brought Gina, who brought you. So the blessings go both ways. So thank you. Thank you. So in every stop I stop along the way on Mary Beth's journey <laughs> through New Jersey and New York, I ask Linda to just share with us. And during this very interesting, crazy time, COVID, um, it's made it a little bit easier to say, yeah, let's do a Zoom in and let's inspire some people. So um, if you could just share a bit about, uh, I've put in the chat your, um, your, your, your real estate, everything real estate and life. So I do want to talk a bit about that. Okay. Your last episode really touched on um, funding freedom. Mm -hmm. And so I'll, I'd like to dive into that. Um, before that, though, you did write the book Hold. And right. so there's a bit of that story that I'd like for you to just share to get us to where we are today. Okay, absolutely. Okay. Yeah, it, it, and all honestly, Mary Beth, it was a situation similar to COVID. Not exactly the same, but certainly similar in a lot of ways. It was an economic downturn in the state of Texas that was actually affecting Texas, Oklahoma, and Arkansas in a massive way in the late 80s. Uh, and to be honest with you, I was 23 years old. I didn't even know what the word economy meant, much less whether it was a good one or a bad one. But my husband, who's nine years older than me, already was an entrepreneur and owned restaurants and nightclubs. And so I knew something was wrong because all of a sudden he would not want to go to bed at night. Uh, and the reason he didn't want to go to bed, he would eventually tell me, is because when he went to bed, morning came 
very quickly. And when morning came, bankers would be calling him. And the reason bankers were calling him is because we had gone to Dallas, taken all the money we made from the nightclubs that were successful in our local college town. And we had gone about 35 miles uh, south in Dallas and was going to try to make it bigger. And so by doing that, we got a business off the ground as the economy was crashing. <laughs> and so we wound up selling that business for $600,000 less than what we owed again. It. So literally we woke up one day uh, and we were now $600,000 in debt. And so he was panicking on how we were going to get out of that. And again, I'm 23. I, I didn't go to college right out of high school. Um, nobody in my family had gone to college. So college didn't even enter my mind. Uh, people in my family got married and you didn't go to college. And so I just didn't think about college. I don't know why, but I didn't. And so because of that, uh, Jimmy was actually my second marriage. I was married for a very short period of time right after high school. And um, so it was his suggestion that I go back to college and, you know, try to figure out who are you. I had, I'm always been a hard worker and, you know, I work two and three jobs sometimes during high school, but I never made more than minimum wage except for when I waitressed at his or bartended at his nightclub. So I needed to find something that I could make more than minimum wage. And so he had suggested I go back to college and I'm in the middle of college when all of this happens. And so I already have um, uh, two small children and trying to go to college and try to work and help him at the nightclub. So I, I didn't even really know the grasp of what was happening, but I knew something was wrong because we went from having money to all of a sudden we didn't have any money and we had to trade in our car and get a beat up car. And there was just lots of sacrifices that we had to make quickly because we were so far in debt almost overnight. Uh, what I like to say when I teach fierce is that gradually and then suddenly mm -hmm. that, you know, that wakes us up, that jolts us, jolts us up. And so the, the pain of going through that really, and I think, I hope this is what COVID does for a lot of people, Mary Beth, I hope it becomes our wake up call to say, what freedoms did I not have during this experience that when and if the next gradually and then suddenly happens, I want my life to be in a different place. Because, you know, I always say, if you give anything like this long enough, it will go from something that you feel is horrible or not so fun to being able to be your greatest blessing if you let it. And that's what that crash did for us because it woke us up and said, look, just having a cash flow business or job isn't enough. You've got to protect yourself against lots of different things that could happen. And so I, I will always count that as a blessing because as I looked at my husband and said, you know, I'm a hard worker and I'm happy to help you out of this, but what in the world am I going to be able to do, you know, to, to make this kind of money? And it was his suggestion that I get into real estate in the first place. And it was because a mentor of his told him, that if you wanna make a lot of money, real estate's the way to do it. Now we've since thought about what that guy was saying and because he was a developer out of Dallas, I don't think he said, you know what, get a wife, get her to sell houses, you guys will be rich forever. I don't think that's what he meant. No. But because you misunderstand based on where you are when you hear a message, I'm thankful G Jimmy misunderstood because, because he misunderstood, I did get into real estate and it actually wound up being a great match for me. Um, not in the beginning, it wasn't because I only made $3,000 gross. Jimmy said, Linda, this is real gross because I've spent 15 for you to make three. You're not helping. <laughs> You're making us go backwards. But I knew if I could ever get around, you know, there was no training. There was no Keller Williams. So you didn't know how to sell real estate. You just fumbled your way forward. And so um, it was an affiliate paying for me a ticket to go to a Mike Ferry seminar that changed everything for me. It, it made me realize that anything you want to do in life, if you can go find the people that have already done it successfully and they're willing to share, mm -hmm. you can learn exactly what you need to do. And then you just need to be willing to go do whatever it is they tell you to do. And so because of that, I began to get my legs about me and start to make money, pretty good money in real estate. And Jimmy's business didn't seem like it was going to come back anytime soon. So after a couple of years, when I was starting to do well, we decided he should just join me in real estate. But in the back of our mind, what we're constantly thinking about is how painful that economic crash was and how we never wanted to be in that place again. So we started to read books and ask people, 
who are the people that don't get affected by gradually and then suddenly? Who are those people? And the best book that we ever read that really, and I don't know why, maybe it was just for us at that moment, mm -hmm. was Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow Quadrant. Rich Dad Poor Dad is a great book and everybody reads that one, but it's mm -hmm. actually his second book that gave us the answers. And what it said was wealthy people make their money passively and they make it from three different ways, real estate investing, stock market, or owning businesses. Now, what we watched happen in Texas in the late 80s is anybody who had been a speculator, in other words, they bet on something to come, not because it was a good deal at the time, they lost everything. So we knew that if we weren't willing to learn about something, we were going to be more of a speculator than we were an investor. So that put stocks kind of out of the way for us because neither one of us wanted to learn it well enough to be a true investor. We would always just be a speculator trusting someone else. So that put stocks out of the way because we had been burnt a little bit by Jimmy owning businesses, businesses weren't at the top of our mind. But by this time I'm selling real estate pretty well thinking, well, surely if we can sell real estate, we can learn how to buy some real estate. And so that's why we picked real estate as our first choice. Uh, we built a little plan on having, you know, what was our freedom number and everyone should come up with their freedom number. And in a minute, I'll give you a text in number where you can actually get our, our actual worksheet that, that we have everybody work through on how to come up with your freedom number. And we came up with 250,000. We just said, you know what, if in 20 years, cause Jimmy's again is nine years older than me. And at the time he was almost about to turn 40. We said, what about if we, we base it, on, base it on your years and we say in 20 years, no more than 20 years, we want $250,000 coming into us passively. And we just build a plan around that and we go to work. And so and our first- To be clear, that, that's a year, right? You, a year. At that point it was, you want yeah, 250,000. A year. We wanted, yeah. And that way, if we wanted to keep selling houses, we could. And if we didn't, we thought maybe we could quit. And so we built a plan with investing only. And that was for us to buy 20 properties have them paid off in 20 years and they all bring us somewhere between a thousand and twelve hundred dollars a month. Mm -hmm. And so by doing that, we would get close to that two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. And that was our first original plan. And so, you know, the reason I think you have to start with a number and a goal is because I believe for me it's the good Lord will start putting the opportunities in your path to go get that what you want. And if you don't ever set that decision on how much or whatever, I don't know that you get all those or, or maybe those opportunities are there and you can't see them. Yeah. So we made a goal. And of course, the minute I made the goal, I went out and found a property and I came home all excited because I found a property that the people weren't living there anymore. It had serious major repairs needed and they wanted to just sell to an investor and get out quick. So I came home super excited and Jimmy immediately reminded me that we were broke and we couldn't go to the bank. And so I went to sleep that night and when I woke up the next morning, I had the answer and the answer was one of my builders. And I went to my builder and I said, I'm going to go to Lou Craft. I think he'll do it with me. He trusted me. I trusted him. And I said, Lou, I found a deal. We can make $15,000 on it if you'll be my partner because I'll throw my commission in and, and we'll pay you to do the construction and then whatever's left, we'll split it. It should be about $15,000. And sure enough, it was a 15 exactly. And before that money was spent, an agent in my office came to me and said, look, there's an RTC foreclosure, which is what the Resolution Trust Corporation was back then. That was the arm that, that handled all the foreclosures for the savings and loans. And they said to me, she said to me, I know you want to invest in real estate. I have a property close to the college for $15,000, but it's in bad shape. So I went to Lou and said, let's don't spend the money. Let's go buy this property. And sure enough, we turned that into a fourplex and we were off and running. So the first three properties, I found a partner because we had no money. Uh, and then now we're way over hundred and something properties and you know, nine, and actually we just closed on another uh, uh, vacation rental. So now we're up to 20 vacation rentals and none of it would have been possible if I had said, well, we don't have the money and we don't have the credit. So where there's a will, there's a way. The minute you decide the opportunities will come your way to get this done. And you'll see more and more of those, the more you exercise 
the opportunities. And so that kind of got us into our real estate investing. And then um, at the time there was no Keller Williams. So there wasn't an opportunity for a profit share. Uh, so and, I just Linda, didn't, if, yeah. If I'm not mistaken, those 20 vacation properties and, and some of these properties, they weren't necessarily in your backyard, right? Were they, are these the Missouri ones? Yes, we only have two vacation rentals in Texas that are close to us. And the reason we have the ones in Texas is we bought a ranch. After we went and saw Gary Keller's ranch, I knew it was going to cost us money because we went. he took us to see his ranch in Austin, and it was amazing. So ours is a mini version of his big ranch. But we came home, and sure enough, an opportunity comes along right away. They drop the price on it. It's right outside the city limits. And we were going to get it and just have a place to go play. And then we wound up being so busy that we never went there much. And so I said, why don't we try these as vacation rentals also? And they are killing it. They, there's something about being right outside the city limits with a beautiful sunset and you're on a farm, but you're close to everything that the people love. And so the, they're killing it as vacation rentals right now. So Jimmy's mad at me because we can't get into our own ranch unless we book it way far in advance. But yeah, so most of them are in Missouri, Branson, Missouri, which is a vacation retreat uh, type mm -hmm. place. Uh, it's a good old family oriented place. People love it. And then the two that we have in Texas. So absolutely. So then we um, fast forward, I'm building the real estate business more and more. And um, then all of a sudden Keller Williams comes along. And to be honest with you, um, I wasn't really, interested in Keller Williams profit share in the beginning. I wouldn't even let anybody talk to me about it because it kind of felt a little bit hoaxy. But um, about four years into being with Keller Williams, I had a really bad transaction. And I always like to say it's the kind of transaction, you know, the one where you, you, you decide you hate this business so bad, you go get your resume out. Well, it was when I got that resume out that I went, oh, I remember why I sell real estate now. Okay. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right, maybe I'll go try this a little bit longer. So I put the resume back up. That resume was going to get me about minimum wage. I was definitely making more than that. Mm -hmm. So I decided to give real estate a little bit longer go. But I also made a point that at that moment, I was going to go learn about our profit share better. So I looked up the person in the company that knew the most about profit share. And I said, I need you to help me understand profit share. I want to make, if I'm going to do it, I want to make a million dollars at it. And I'm sure he was laughing inside. But I said, what do I need to do if that's what I want to make? And he said, you need to go get 20 people, help 20 get 20, and get 5,000 people total. And I just put that in my little Nokia phone and looked at it every day that I flipped my phone up. And then it was months later that I was in a mastermind with Gary Keller because he's always met with his top, back then it was probably about top 25, but he always meets with his top 100 to 200 people. And so we were talking about multiple streams of income and how do you create multiple streams of income as a real estate agent? What are your options? And so when we went, he asked everybody to go away and do a performa on a different business besides your real estate sales business. Mm -hmm. So we went around the room and I was sitting in the very last seat that day. And so when it got to me, insurance was gone, mortgage was gone, title was gone, home inspection was gone. Everything was gone. I didn't know what to pick. So Gary said, well, why don't you pick, um, profit share. You've been wanting to learn about our profit share. Why don't you come back and show everybody if they treated profit share as a standalone business, what the potential looks like. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I did. I panicked first of all, because I still had no idea where does this profit share money even come from and how does it get distributed and, and all that. So I went to the same gentleman that helped me before we, he helped me put a performance together and it was very convicting that this was a huge opportunity and that everybody should be taking advantage of it. And so that's kind of what launched me into um, deciding to make profit share a very viable stream of income. And then I said, well, how am I going to do this? And I thought about if you sent me to New Jersey to build New Jersey, or if you sent me to Canada to build Canada, I would use the same formula that I used to build my real estate business. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's the same formula that I used to build my profit share. And so if you if you can take yourself back to your high school days, I think this was an algebra formula. I didn't do very good in school, so y'all correct me if I'm wrong. But if you'll write the big capital R and then a plus sign and then a big capital V and then another plus sign and then another capital V 
and then put a line under all of that and put a capital T. That is the magic formula. Whether I was building a real estate transaction business to do 200 transactions a year, when they sent me to Ohio to build Keller Williams up there, it's what I used. And it's the same formula I used to build my profit share, mine and Jimmy's profit share to about a million and a half a year. And so what does that formula actually mean? Well, the first R stand, the first letter R stands for relationships. Who do you enjoy being a hero to? I love helping agents who are struggling with getting and understanding that they need leverage in their life, whether it's time or leverage of their money or freedom of their time or freedom of their money. I don't necessarily wake up every day and want to go help the brand new agent. Not that I don't care about them, but if I had to do it all day long, it would suck my energy. So who you want to be hero to is someone that if you were helping them, it would give you tons of energy. energy. And so you want to gauge that by who gives, whether it's your real estate business or who you're building your profit share tree with, who could you help all day long and you don't worry about what time it is or what's, is it time to eat? That's how I gauge whether I'm having a good time. If I'm thinking about eating, I'm not having that great of a time. I just want to go eat. <laughs> but I don't worry about what I'm getting paid either. But here's what I figured out. When you give value to the world, the more value you give, the more money is going to come back. You can't keep the money away. So you don't even have to focus on the money. You have to focus on what's the value I'm giving to the world. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So who do you want to be a hero to? Who do you love helping? Who are you already helping? Who, what agents already come to you for stuff? This is how I would pick who I would pick to build my profit share tree with. Then the next letter is a capital V and that stands for validity because Mary Beth, if you don't have validity or I don't have validity, people aren't going to open a door to a relationship. We have to figure out how to build that validity. And as you grow your validity, different relationship doors are going to open up because your validity has grown. And so what is validity? Here's what I like to say about validity. Everybody has it and nobody thinks they do, but everybody has it. You have some, can you build it? Absolutely. So some of your validity comes from your past experiences, your past failures, your past successes, probably your failures as much as your successes, right? Absolutely. And then also what books have you read? What classes have you taken? All of that becomes a person's validity. So if I was going to pick this for my real estate sales business and I wanted to go get in business with some of the greatest business owners in my city, I'd have to be able to learn and talk business to them so that when I open my mouth, I'm valid to them. That's going to allow them to let me build a deeper relationship. The more people know you and trust you, the more they open the doors to a re deep relationship with you. Absolutely. So I always say, look, pick five people. Uh, in the real estate business, five below, I mean, pick one below, one or two below your production, one or two at your production and one or two above your production. Because you, because you're with Keller Williams, you have validity in all those ranges. Mm -hmm. And you might say, well, why do I have validity with somebody who does a little bit more than me? Well, because you have more tools than they do. You can even use things like the books that have been written through Keller Williams as your validity. The MREA book, I see it behind Mary Beth, the hold book, the one thing book, the shift book, all that, all that material, every class you've ever taken in Keller Williams, any one piece of material out of those classes can help you create validity for someone else because it's knowledge that you have that you can help someone well else with. And then the, the, the next letter is another capital V and that stands for value gap. And Zig Ziglar, one of my favorite um, mm -hmm. motivational speakers said it years ago, you're going to get what you want in life if you'll just go help enough other people get what it is they want. But the key words in all of that is what do they want? So Mary Beth, I can't assume if I'm trying to build a relationship with you and I'm trying to help you fill your value gaps, I can't assume what your value gaps are. I need to get to know you and ask you questions and learn what your value gaps are because what we do in Keller Williams when we're trying to get someone to join Keller Williams, we usually sell and tell mm -hmm. or we try to believe that they should their value gap should be the same one as ours or whatever we think it should be. Instead of getting to know them and learning what their value gap is, um, that's the only way. Because I always say when I joined Keller Williams, if you'd been trying to recruit me, most of you would have tried to sell me on the fact that I would save $80,000 the day I joined Keller Williams. 
But for me, that wasn't my biggest value gap at that moment. My biggest struggle at that moment was my company kept fighting me over they thought they were the brand and I wanted to build a big brand in my town that everybody, when they thought of real estate, thought of me. But I kept running into obstacles because my company kept wanting to be the brand. So all you would have had to help me self-discover is that KW believes the agent is the brand and their job is to support the agent and be in the brand. That would have been really the most beneficial to me. Yeah, even as, even as I help other team leaders, you know, I've, I've been in the team leader lane for about 12 years now. And as I help other team leaders understand that because they'll get frustrated with like, well, I have all these appointments or, and I, and I said, you're just, you're just going with, think about a listing appointment. You're going in on a listing appointment. You should be asking that seller, why are they looking to me? What's their motivation? What do they think their best asset in the house is? You're not going to write up a description about their house and not include what they think the best selling feature is. So it's the same with the relationships and the agents. And if you ask enough questions, nobody's asking them questions like we, like we have. Right. And, right. and it will reveal itself. And then to your point is then you've identified something and we have the remedy somewhere in our system tools. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Yeah. The beautiful thing is we don't have to recreate any of that. We just have to know where to go find it. And, you know, I always say the two best ways that I like to start a conversation. So let's say our group today, Mary Beth, picks their five people. Then they got to say, well, how do I start a conversation with them? And my two favorite ways to start a conversation with anyone is number one, a compliment. But here's the deal. It has to be genuine, genuine and real. People see through you making stuff up. So trust me, if you think long and hard enough, you can think of a genuine and real compliment for someone. And here's the other thing I like to say about compliments. Nobody ever minds a new one and nobody ever gets enough of them. So you can never lose by giving someone a genuine and real compliment. And then my second way to start a conversation is asking them what they think. You know, I teach Fierce probably two or three times a year. It's one of my favorite courses. I teach it selfishly so that I can master the material myself. And I love to see the change lives as I teach the course. But one of my favorite parts in the Fierce class is there was a, G, a guy from GE who took their Fierce course. And he said, you know, my aha is that for 35 years, GE had my hands and for free, they could have had my head. And mm -hmm. I always remember that. So asking people what they think or what their input is, is one of the greatest ways to ever start a conversation. Because again, nobody ever gets asked enough what they think or what their input is. And Oprah Winfrey said in all the years of her interviewing people that she believes the number one desire that people have is to be understood, not just interpreted. And the way you understand people is you ask them great questions and you get to know them. And so after I start the conversation, I very quickly will try to change that conversation to about their business and how's it going? You know, how, how's COVID affecting them? Uh, what's, you know, how are their goals for this year? What's been their biggest challenge in hitting any of their goals? You know, what's the biggest obstacle that, and I throw a little bit in because con in Spanish means with. And so if I don't throw anything in, it's just a versation and that doesn't feel good to anybody. But let's say if I was having a conversation with Mary Beth, let's just role play if it's okay with you, Mary Beth. I would say, hey, ring, ring. Hey, Linda. Hey, Mary Beth, how are you? Hey, I just wanted to call you real quick and say thank you so much for doing that deal over there at 123 Main Street. And what a blessing it was and a breath of fresh air how responsive you were and you returned the calls and that's just unheard of these days. So I just want to call and tell you how much I appreciate that and, 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 and just say thank you for that responsiveness and your professionalism on, on getting that closed. Geez, well, thank you so much. It's very rare that you'd have anybody even say thank you for it. I appreciate you making the call. Oh, well, you're very welcome. Hey, why have you on the phone? I always make it a habit of ask, asking top agents kind of how's it going in their business? Is there, you know, what you, you know, what's, what's been the biggest effect of COVID for you and your business? We've just been so crazy. We can't keep any properties on the market and the multiple bids with our buyer's agents, we're just getting beat out of yeah. many, many, yeah. many, you know, our, our agents are working three, four times the amount of hours and to get the deal accepted. So yeah, just that, just yeah. people, you know, yeah, absolutely. I hear you. Boy, chart, uh, listings are a big shortage. Has that been a big issue for you, getting more listings? Absolutely. And like I said, when we get them, we we, we don't even we don't even get the marketing exposure like we, we used to get because yeah. they just go so fast, absolutely. and the seller doesn't want it anymore. As soon as it's done, they just want it done because it's been 
It was too much for them. Yes, so true. Yeah, it's kind of a crazy thing, but you know, it's the market of the moment, right? So we just had to figure out how to, how to, you know, work in it. Thank God so we have listings though, right? Thank God there's uh -huh. listings and buyers out there. Yes, I'm so happy. Hey, I'd rather that than some of these restaurants that are sitting empty. Yeah. That, yeah. Right? Yeah, so true. So, yeah, so what's been, what kind of training and stuff have you been able to attend during this? I know I've been on a lot more Zooms trying to get it all figured out and how to do it all virtually. What have you, what have you kind of found? You know, I've been tapping into some stuff actually on your page and in your office. I've been seeing some interesting classes. I've been watching a bit, but you know, there's really nothing being offered at my 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 office. So, um, just trying to get through this time. I guess because it's summer and a lot of our leadership isn't even in because COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, everybody's just doing the best they can. Gotcha. Well, I tell you what, Mary Beth, if I happen to run across any great training that I find is going to be helpful for me, because it sounds like we're kind of in the same boat um, on some of the similarities on some of those, I'd be happy to, to include you if, if, if that would oh, be I'd beneficial. Love that. Yeah. Awesome. I'd Good. Love well, that, yeah. Awesome. Well, Mary Beth, again, thank you. I hope you and I can do another deal real soon. Let's both oh, go out and get love great. It, Linda. Yeah. All right. Well, let's stay in touch. Thank you, Mary Beth. Bye-bye. So here's the thing. All I want to do is have a conversation with Mary Beth and see if I can get a few things out that might be some value gaps that she has. And I'm throwing enough in that it's a conversation and not a versation. And I'm not, here's the thing we got to let ourselves know. I can't recruit Mary Beth. I'm not, I'm a great salesperson. Don't get me wrong, but I can't make a seller sell, a buyer buy, or an agent join. What I can do is get them to self-discover that whatever their value gap is, we have the stuff needed to fill that. And when they self-discover that, that's when they'll join Keller Williams. So a couple of points. I never say Keller Williams and I never say KW. Even if I'm going to give them, a, so let's say, for example, next week, what do I do next time I call Mary Beth? Well, what I'm going to do is <laughs> I'm going to make a mental note that she needs help with listings. She's interested in some training. I want to make two or three mental notes. And I don't have to get it 100% perfect. I just got to... I just got to start giving to Mary Beth because when I start giving to Mary Beth, this beautiful thing called beholdenness is an, an amazing motivator that makes people want to give back to you. Mm -hmm. So what I want Mary Beth to eventually give back to me on is when I ask her to take a big step because I've been giving and giving and giving and creating beholdenness and reciprocity uh, with Mary Beth. When I do eventually probably ask her to come on to a training, she's going to say yes. And if she doesn't, I'll just go back to doing what I was doing before. So let's say, for example, I decided that the couple of things I think Mary Beth could use is there's a great source in one of our classes that talks about the two ways to get business. And what I've found is sometimes there's ways to get listings that we haven't thought about. Or let's say I was on a KW Connect and I took really good notes from a whole panel of our top producers and they talked about how they're doing some things for their local businesses that's getting them some business. Whatever the idea is, I'm going to start myself a file and keep this stuff. And it doesn't even have to be perfect. So when I call Mary Beth back, I'm going to say, hey, Mary Beth, ring, ring. This is Linda. Hey, Linda, how are you? Good. I'm hey. running out. Huh? I'm just running out. I got a buyer right now. Oh, hey, no, gonna... no problem. Listen, real quick, I was just thinking about mine and your conversation the other day. And uh -huh. one of the things that you said you really needed was you know, some ideas on getting listings during this COVID time. I don't know if you'd be offended or not, but I have great notes from a class I just took on some ideas that people are doing uh, for local business owners. So it kind of gives us a chance to get. Ooh, I love that idea. Okay. Well, I'd be happy to share that with you. I got a couple options. I can either just email it to you because I know you're in a hurry or you and I can, I don't know how you feel about getting out, <laughs> but uh, Starbucks on fifth has a, has an outside patio. I can meet you for a cup of coffee and I can share some more details about what I learned on it. Or I can just stick it to uh, uh, in the email or stick it in the package in the mail. Which would you prefer? I mean, you know what? Could you just text me some information right now? And I, mean, sure, next, I would love to meet with you, though. You, I would love to hear your your side of it. But can I give you a, a text back and figure out something for next week? Absolutely. Happy to do it. I'll get that over to you. And then let's meet for coffee. And I want to give you some of the details on how they're doing some of it. So Ooh, I love that. that's I love coming that. over in the next 30 minutes. So good luck on your showing. Thank you. See, I'm not trying, I don't say Keller Williams, I'm not trying to recruit her, I can't recruit her, I'm trying to build a relationship, create beholdenness, 
And when she self discovers that the things she needs to take her business to the next level, she'll start bringing Keller Williams up to me. And the first thing she usually says is, hey, if I were ever gonna go anywhere, it would be Keller Williams. And I say, that's awesome, Mary Beth, because you're the exact kind of agent we wanna be in business with. And then I go right back to talking about whatever we were talking about, because that's only once. Then Mary Beth brings it up again. Here's what she usually will say. Hey, what would it cost me if I joined Keller Williams? Now I'm going to hook Mary Beth up with my team leaders because I don't want to have to worry about learning all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, these are agents that have been in the business a while. These are people that it's going to take building a deep relationship with. If it's a brand new agent, I'm going to get them to Mary Beth as fast as possible because they're in a lot of pain and they need some help. But I'm going to stay in relationship with them long enough that they know me uh, and I'm going to offer some help, you know, to give them some little something so that they remember me. Because by the time they get to Mary Beth, they're going to forget about me if they're new and I haven't spent much time with them. You're only going to spend time with someone who's an existing agent. That's why I say don't pick more than five because you can't, you don't have the time to go deep. But And most people don't do their profit share in Mary Beth because they think it's either or. Either I got to build my real estate business or I got to build my profit share. And the truth is, it's and. What am I doing tomorrow? How many on this call need to lead generate more? If you need to lead generate more, why couldn't you invite someone that you'd already been pouring into to come along and shadow you while you lead generate? I promise you it'll be the best lead generation day you've ever had. And you're going to give value to them because nobody else is letting them watch them lead generate. Or if they need to hire somebody and you're about to do a career visioning process, let them be the shadow while you do your career visioning process. Everything you're doing tomorrow if you'd already been pouring into someone could be the next big step you ask them to take and some will take it and some aren't ready. So then you go back to pouring back into them and, and following up and saying, how did that work for you? What else can you, you know, you just build that real, it's a conversation. It's not recruiting because you're not good enough to recruit somebody. They're, they're only going to join when they self discover that what they need. And so, so what's the worst thing someone could say, let's go ahead and get that covered Mary Beth. And then we'll open it up for questions. Um, sure. I'll, tell you, I'll tell you the bottom T the bottom T is time. Uh -huh. They it's their timing, not mine. And I can't move that only they can move that. So relationship plus my validity plus their value gap over time. So, let's say what the worst thing they could say is, oh, Mary Beth, oh, Linda, let's say Mary Beth, you just say to me, Linda, you're just trying to recruit me. Because yeah, Linda, you're just trying to recruit me. I've heard this before. You're always just trying, all Keller Williams agents are just trying to recruit me over there. Okay, so here's, okay, pause, okay, pause for a second. And I want you to immediately, if someone ever says to that, you, that to you when you're using my formula, I want you to say immediately, have I tried to recruit this person wrong in the past? And that's why they're responding that way to me. Or am I doing it wrong right now? Because if you're following the formula, I'm telling you, there's no way they think you're trying to recruit them. So you either did it wrong in the past or someone else did it wrong in the past mm -hmm. or you're doing it wrong now. So if you can literally say, no, I promise Linda, I'm following your formula. Then I just know that either I did it wrong with Mary Beth earlier or someone else did and it doesn't matter. Here's what I would say. Well, here's the thing, Mary Beth, you're the exactly the exact professional kind of agent that we want to be in business with. But here's what I know for sure. If you ever believe that the tools and things that you need to take your life and your family's life to the next level is over here at Keller Williams, girl, I won't have to recruit you. You'll be knocking my door down. And then I just go right back to talking about what we were talking about. I just take the <laughs> air out of it and I'm, we're going to go right back and talk about whatever we were talking about. Does that make sense? It does. So I think by having that in their head, they won't say, well, I would call them, but they're going to think I'm just trying to recruit them. Right. So what questions you're here? I know we're not supposed to say, but, but if you were going to go do this tomorrow, what are the buts that are going to come up in your head that are going to keep you from doing it? Because those are the gaps I didn't fill in for you. That's right. And so while we get some here, um, what if, they are a newer agent in our system and they may not have been exposed to as much as we have and maybe can't speak. So for, there's not a confidence. What are some things that maybe they can go and learn to, today and over the next week, study, read so that they do have the, the wall street journal conversation for the New Yorker. You know, yeah. when I, when I started up in Hoboken, that was a lesson for me is go read the wall street journal so that you could talk like the New Yorkers talk. Right. So yeah. What could they do to give themselves the confidence? 
Well, I think what you do is because we're not going to do an either or. I'm not going to work on my real estate business or work on my recruiting. I'm going to do both. So what's the best thing you could do for your, that you need to learn for your own business? Because what you're learning for your own business, there's somebody else out there that's a little bit behind you that doesn't have that and needs it also. Okay. So that's what I would do is whatever you're learning and that's why I said in your first five people you pick for your downline, pick a few, just a few right above your production, a few right at and a few below, because then you're going to have either the knowledge yourself of how to help them because you're a little farther along than them, or you're going to have a tool in KW that they don't have. And so here's the thing. So let's say they start a conversation with somebody. There's always somebody at their production, right above your, their production and right below their production. So when they start that, let's say, for example, they figure out that the person needs help on um, a listing presentation or something, then, then what they got to do is they got to, if they don't know where to help find help for that on Connect, then they're going to come to you, Mary Beth, and say, hey, I've got a person. And by the way, keep all this on a whiteboard or somewhere right in front of you so you don't forget these people. But I would say, I would put Mary Beth's name and I would put her two or three things I felt like that she would like some help with. And then I'm going to just be that as my reminder. And all of a sudden, I'm going to start finding things that, and I don't even have to get it 100% right. right. Just the pure act that I'm willing to pour into Mary Beth and give her is going to create that beholdenness. I'm going to try to get it as close to right to what she needs as I can. But um, go to your team leader and say, hey, I need help. This is what I think that person's value gap is. What would be some things you would just give them freely? Like if I know someone needs to hire someone, I don't give them the whole career visioning book. I give them the 26 questions out of the career visioning book, or I give them, if they're trying to hire their first assistant, I give them the job description from one of our courses mm -hmm. for that person. I just try to think if they are going to be doing this, where could they use a little bit of help? And I'm going to be that little bit of help. And what I'm doing when I do that, because remember people don't join because you tell them they join because they self discover. And the three best ways to get anyone to self discover is stories that they can relate to. So if you've got someone 600,000 in debt, feel free to tell them my story. Um, you know, stories that they can relate to, questions that make them think, or experientially. If I can get them on some of our Zoom training, they're going to experientially feel what our energy feels like, our culture feels like. If we're doing Red Day and that culture is big to them and I include them in our, our, cult, our Red Day, they're going to experience what our culture is like. So depending on what's important to them, I, here's a crazy one. I took a recruit to a seal fit training we did one time because she did all the tough mutters and thank God we took her. She saved most of us at Keller Williams lives because she, she was like so beastly and we were all a bunch of wimps, but we took her, we invited, I just called her out of the blue. I thought, you know, Bonnie would probably love something like this. So what I showed her is that we're a team and we always felt like we were these team of sheep and she was this one little goat because she was the only one not with KW. And, and she loves us now. We haven't gotten her yet because we don't have a market center in her location, but she did save our lives at Seal Fit and she loved it. And she's probably told people about that experience. Exactly. So I, ma I try to match the person with something they need. And that's why you can't have very many of these people because you can't get to know them deep enough to know. I've sent pictures off of Facebook of a girl's cute, cute, cute dog she had because she's so busy doing 140 transactions with no assistant and no help. I just said, hey, I know you ain't got time to do this and this dog is precious and it needed to be framed. And I sent her a note. She laughs because she knows I tell her all the time, when you're sick of working yourself to death, let me know, you know, or I'm teaching a class and it tells all the myths of why you don't hire somebody. I circle one of them and send her a text. So you'll find these little things that you can do and build this friendship with these people that goes deep enough that gives you a chance to get them into something that where they can self-discover that KW is the best place for them to be. Does that make sense? It does. And I, I think you're saying a few things. <clears throat> Number one is some people may have thought that they had to have hundreds of people in this database in order to, you know, capture right. some great right. agents in their downline. And, and it's just the opposite. I do believe that um, it's more of a relationship building and, and it's something where you are tapping you're tapping into their, their person. It's a genuine relationship. If you don't genuinely like this person, why would you even want them to come and work with us, right? So um, identifying the who is one thing. Um, another thing is it's not superficial questions. It, it's really getting to know them and, and it may not be real estate. It just is 
who they are and how you can help them in life, period. One of the things might be sharing your podcast, Everything Life and Real Estate. Um, That right there is giving tips on just how to balance life and the business and what you want. One thing you said, though, in the beginning is the clarity. The clarity, and, you know, I am a believer as well. I do think sometimes God does not give us what we're asking for because we haven't been so clear as to what we're even looking for. Mm-hmm. And, um, and we also shortchange ourselves on what we think we can have. Um, Linda, you, 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 you put it out there, a million dollars in 5,000 people. And, and I believe oh, yeah. you are way past 5,000 in the family tree right now, right? Yeah. I don't know how many because I don't keep up with all that stuff. But uh, Dick Dillingham would be able to tell you like that. <laughs> But, yeah. but uh, you know, and, and here's the thing. I don't need, I didn't even really pay attention to any of that stuff. I needed it to get me started. But after a while, I don't pay attention who comes, who goes. Sure. If I can help anybody in my downline, I do. I'm always willing to do that. But, but it's not as, it's not as systematic as people think. Sure. You know, it really is just saying what worked for me to build a real estate transaction business to over 200 transactions a year. It's this relationship plus validity plus value over time. And just because that's natural for me, I can do that easily. And, and anybody can do that. You're probably already doing that with your real estate business and just apply that to whatever other, I could, I could show you how that same formula helped us build to over a hundred and something uh, investment properties. I mean, the same formula right. works for everything. And so just decide, and I have to tell you, I love it. If I could just do that all day long, talk to megas and top producers and what I like to call the untouchables, the ones that you look out in the marketplace and you think that they don't have any needs at all, that's the ones I love to go after. I love the one that nobody thinks has any value gaps and so therefore they're scared to do anything with them because what could that person possibly still need? Bring me that person. That's who I love. No, those are my favorite. Absolutely. But don't bring me news because they drain my energy because I just want to hook a hose from my head to theirs because there's so much I need to teach them in such a short period of time. That's right. And for the newer agents, um, we have Ignite. There's so many little one-pagers, one, line, one pagers, even the lead sheet. Oh, Ignite, yes. Buyer lead sheet, seller lead sheet, five must-haves, those kind of things. They, they don't get at other companies. No, and you could... And trust me, when while you were new, there's other people that chose other companies that are new that are out there dying on the vine. So you could find those people and say, hey, I don't know if this would help you at all or not, but I just got this in a class I took the other day, and I'd be happy to share. And you just start building that relationship and coming along beside them. And I'm going to tell you, people are going to be hungrier than ever for people who care. The The void in the world, the, the chasm is getting bigger in our world where people feel so alone and so isolated people want someone who cares and so you start stepping into that gap um and i promise you you can you will not be able to keep the gifts and the and the the value that you get out of it away it's just not possible you cannot out get you cannot out give what you're going to get back you just can't you know i've even got people that i've never gotten before but I have to tell you the goodwill that they send back by telling other people how amazing we are is so worth it within itself. Even if I never get them to join our company, what do I hurt by having a number one agent in a city saying how amazing the McKissicks are for helping them out of a situation with some of their investment properties because they couldn't see their way out of it. And we flew them to Dallas, spent a couple of days with them, helped them through the situation and they've still never joined me. But I promise you the goodwill that she puts out there, she might be saying to one person that we are trying to get what amazing people we are. Yeah. And, and who knows if that agent looks to retire down the line and, and they want to sell their business, you might just be the person. Exactly. That. I promise you, you want to give it I watch time. people, Mary Beth, that's such a great point because mm-hmm. you wouldn't believe the people I watch cost themselves major opportunity because of the way they treat people along the way. That one little decision to act like people aren't in. See, I say the reason we don't build our profit share trees bigger is because we think the most important relationships we can have is with buyers and sellers. And yet I've made more money from my relationships with other agents than thousands of real estate transactions. And not one single buyer or seller ever looked at me with tears in their eyes and said, thank you, you changed my life. They said amazing real estate deals. And we tell everybody to use the McKissick group but they never had tears in their lives and said, thank you. You changed my life and my family's life. That's significance. Yeah. 
Never that makes it all worth it. Absolutely. And everyone on this call could probably tell you how their life has been changed. Uh, and so where do, who are we to decide that that's enough lives changed? Mm -hmm. Good point. Oh, I, I'm on fire right now. <laughs> <laughs> Me and Mary Beth going after it. We're going to go get I'm it. I'm going after it. I am, you know, and it, it, it's, it's just, there's so many people out there that they can really use what we have, the solutions that we have inside of our organization and, and all the opportunities that have come up during 2020 uh, with indies. You know, there are some independent owners out there that that was not an opportunity before, especially in the New Jersey pocket. Um, yeah. it's, it's a little challenging, right? But there was not an opportunity to take an independent broker owner who has a legacy to leave inside of a, a, a niche market, let's say, and they don't want to lose their identity, we were never able to say, hey, come under our umbrella and we can help you. We can show you the tools. We can train your people without you losing that complete identity. And now KW has made that model where it's possible. So Yeah, and we're using the word, we're doing really well in our area with, with Indies and we're using the word collaborate. Let's you and I get together and collaborate on how we could work together because nobody wants to be under and nobody wants the other person to be over. Mm -hmm. So we're using the word collaborate on how we can take your strengths and our tools and put them together and collaborate and work together. And Great so word. that's really working super well for us. Great word. Um, all right. So just uh, finishing up here, we only have a few minutes, four minutes. If you have a question, please put it in the chat. Um, I did want to just ask you, where are you now at your journey? I know you mentioned fears. What's coming next? I feel like there's some stuff brewing. Yeah, there is some stuff brewing. Uh, my next projects are to take the formula and expand on them in an online training course and a book. The book will be small, but it's going to hit the formula pretty good. Dive a little bit deeper. Of course, we're going to keep the podcast going because we're having a blast doing that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and we're reaching a lot of people uh, to do that. And then, um, yeah, just do it on the formula that I just gave everybody. We're doing a book and then we're going to create an online course that will cover all aspects of whether you're trying to build your business or your wealth or whatever. How can you use this formula to help you do that? Well, I will absolutely be signing up for that one. Um, it does not look like we have any questions right now. There's been a lot of people from, we even have North North Liberty, Iowa on here. So hello, okay. Jeanette. <laughs> more the merrier, right? <laughs> That's right. I love more the merrier. And we'll also have this recording that we'll be able to um, share out. So if anybody did miss it or just wants to go back and just listen to some of the things, because I mean, Linda just dropped a whole bunch of nuggets on us and I'm going to have to go back and take better notes. Um, what, what are you reading right now and what do you listen to? We could leave um, with that. Okay, that's really, really good. I'm big into intermittent fasting, and one of my projects that's kind of a side project is I want to start an intermittent fasting coaching program because I struggled with food and my weight for 30 years, and I wish I'd have found this 30 years ago, and so I'm sucking down every bit of information and every book I can on intermittent fasting, um, and I love it, and I wish I'd have found it 30 years ago, and every person that I see in the world that I feel like is struggling with the way I struggled, which was constantly uh, about food, it was just a constant battle, I just say a little prayer that God, please help them find intermittent fasting and it be the right answer for them, because I believe we're all so uniquely uh, genetically wired that part of our craziness around food and our journey around food all these years has been we keep trying to fit ourselves into a box and what we need to do is be the science project of one and learn our own uniqueness mm -hmm. and so that's what I love about intermittent fasting is it's forced me to find something that number one could control my appetite because believe it or not you actually do have an appetite gene um, and that's explained a lot to me when I when I learned it because I kept beating myself up thinking I'm so disciplined in so many areas of my life please Lord what's wrong with me here and when you find that you're genetically working against something, uh, for me, that was peace. But it also didn't let me stop and make an excuse. It made me realize that, okay, if I'm working with that, what does that mean? Uh, and I have a great episode on our podcast with my genetics doctor. And he helped. I made him explain the appetite gene I have. Yeah. Um, and uh, so anyway, in this, I've learned, though, because intermittent fasting was working amazing for all these other people like quick, but it wasn't for me, but I was so happy with the way 
my appetite was controlled that I wanted to keep at it and dig into it. And I've tweaked it till I've actually now found a formula that is actually working for me. So I've, I'm on a mission on life to help other people who struggle with that because I think we have so many of our children and our kids that are just going to get worse and worse with this that I would like to be a light in a very dark place with people who do struggle and I did for 30 years and so that's my side side project well, that's my fun I love that way. because that you know I mean I, I've struggled my whole life as well um I've tried everything and done everything and I and I know I think I know it works and we are unique and as the years go by I'm in my 40s now it's a little different yep. than it was in the 20s and 30s it gets, it gets harder um, but there's a sadness that comes when you're not happy with yourself and, and it affects who you who you put portray yourself as and the things that you put yourself out to accomplish so i love that because it doesn't only you know fix the health it also it, it everything relationships absolutely goal yeah. but i also read a lot of books with dan sullivan i'm reading a book called uh, simplifier and multiplier right now it's figuring out are you a simplifier or are you a multiplier so that's a great book. If anybody would like a great book to read on intermittent fasting, there's a great book by a lady until mine comes out. Uh, there's a great book called uh, Delay, Don't Deny by a young teacher, not a young teacher, a teacher that was a teacher her whole life. So she writes in a real simple form and it's called Delay, Don't Deny, which is my favorite words because I hate the word deny. Uh, and then uh, Dan Sullivan's Simplifier and Multiplier is a great book. And figuring out if you're a multiplier, how do you get a simplifier in your life? because we all need the opposites. If I'm a multiplier, which I am, I need more simplifiers in my life. And a few multipliers too. <laughs> is Jimmy a simplifier? Jimmy is a simplifier. Mm -hmm. It's really great. And my son who works so well with me, he's the one that writes all my courses and does a beautiful job. He helped me write the profit share course. Uh, I just wish I had two of him instead of just one uh, because he's so busy. He won't help me with these other courses right now, but he's a simplifier. So I, I need more simplifiers, but I also need multipliers. If I want to go grow a business, I need a multiplier, but I probably also need to make sure that that multiplier has a simplifier, has a simplifier. in their life, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So yeah, so fun stuff. I'm always reading great books, awesome. but I'm always open to new ones if anybody's got a, um, a suggestion. suggestions. Okay, awesome. Well, I the name of the podcast, Jeanette, is Everything Life and Real Estate. Yep amazing you can go back they just posted their newest episode i think posted today yes so um yeah i listen to it all the time love it and dana she's so cute <laughs> love she's her energy perfect yin to my yang and Absolutely. What's funny, if we could ever type the recordings before i told her last night i said hey before we get to that other stuff let's talk about what have you been doing lately let, let me tell you about this new eyebrow technique I did. So we talk about all the good stuff and then we turn on the recorder we probably should just turn the recorder on um, immediately and say yeah. here's the junk stuff before the recorder comes on yeah okay well, I, I want to thank you again thank you for being in my life thank you for being in all of our agents lives uh, being a true example um linda you know is receiving over a million in, pro in this profit share thing that we talk about and um i want that for all of you so um absolutely you know, go out there and get it get it absolutely and mary beth thank you for being the kind of leader that's always wanting to bring value to your people i love that about you and i'm always happy to help you anything mary beth asked me to do i'm willing to do thank you linda well i'll send you an email later about what's going on <laughs> oh, that, that's good, girl. All right. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Have a great, great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Absolutely. Bye-bye.